All right, I am here with Delaney Reynolds. First of all, thank you for taking the time because I know that you are super busy. I heard that a week or two ago, you were with former Vice President Al Gore. Tell us about that. So MTV had me do a special with former Vice President Al Gore in advance of his new movie, An Inconvenient Sequel. So we had a video shoot here in Miami a couple weeks before, and I got to meet with the rapper Fat Joe, and we talked about climate change and how it's been affecting Miami. He lives on Miami Beach, so he understood the impacts, and he said that he's seen the flooding as well, so he knows what's happening. And then a couple weeks later, MTV had me fly up to New York, where I met with Vice President Al Gore, DJ Steve Aoki and Fat Joe again, and we filmed another sequence that was actually aired last night on MTV. So it was very exciting. It was super awesome. And we just talked about climate change, the effects, and it was what they call a town hall. So we took questions from audience members that are of the youth generation because it's going to be our problem to solve. It is our problem to solve. So it was very fun, very exciting, and very informational. So. That's awesome. You're such so you're so inspiring. You're like a rock star to me. So thank you. Wow. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you. So you the, the reason I heard about you was we were covering a story here on Now You Know about South Miami and we heard about their uh, local ordinance to get solar on new residences. And when we heard about it, we we're like, why is this the only city that seems to be doing this? And we found out that you're a large reason why this ordinance even came to be. Can you explain like how you got this all started? Yes, so about a year ago, I learned about the solar ordinances in California. There are three cities there that have implemented solar ordinances, the biggest being San Francisco. And I thought that that was an absolutely amazing idea because our economy needs to begin the transition from fossil fuels to sustainable energy. And so what I did is I wrote a letter to about a dozen mayors here in Miami-Dade County, and I asked them if they would be interested in helping me write a solar ordinance. And Mayor Phil Stoddard of South Miami was the first person to respond. So for the past year, we had been working on drafting it, writing it, looking at the San Francisco one, and adapting it to South Miami's um, laws. And so... We finally finished it and we took it to the county and I spoke in front of the commission and in favor, obviously, and I told them the benefits of solar power, why it would be so important. And so after three readings, they implemented the law. And so now the city of South Miami is the first city in the entire state of Florida to mandate that solar panels be installed on all new homes and any material renovations of existing homes. So the point of the ordinance is really to inspire other people to become involved, whether it's implementing a similar solar law or just putting solar on their roof. Because we live in the Sunshine State and there have been reports that say that 50% of all of Florida's power needs could come from the sun by 2045, if we were to just start taking solar power seriously. And so that was part of my motivation for the solar law. And I see no reason why we can't make the sunshine state into the solar state. And so that's also part of my motivation for implementing the laws. Since the city of South Miami agreed to ma make the mandate, um, other cities around Florida have reached out to me as well. So Orlando, Sarasota, and I've also been working with the city of St. Petersburg. So it's very exciting. And I've also actually had someone from Canada reach out to me to implement the law. So that was really cool as well. That is so inspirational. I mean, so basically you started by just writing some letters and fast forward just about a year or so, and now you're actually getting laws implemented that are changing how cities are doing things. Yes, it's crazy, but it's it's awesome. It's so important. And it proves that anyone can have a voice within their local government. I mean, I don't have a vote. I'm only 17 years old. I was 16 when I wrote the letter to all of the mayors. So even if you don't have a vote, you have a voice in your community and you can make an impact and make a difference in your local community and your local government. I mean, do you hear that, people? I mean, <laughs> Delaney here is proof that basically you can do this, right? I mean, I think most American kids nowadays think that they have no connection whatsoever to their government, right? They think, you know, that's just a bunch of old white guys in Washington, and I, what am I going to do? But you thought to yourself, hey, I can do something, right? And you did. Definitely. So inspirational. 
Thank you. And not Thank only you. that, you were it's not like you were just trying to write some, you know, make the the bluebird the official state, you know, bird or something. This you had a lot of opposition. You had millions of dollars of lobbyists who were fighting against you and you won. Yes, yes. We definitely received opposition from our local power company, Florida Power and Light, because it threatens their very large and successful business. Um and we had opposition from builders and developers, but we were able to overcome all of that by giving the facts, by showing how impactful solar power can be, first of all, to our environment, and second of all, it's way more cost effective than regular electricity from the grid, because once it's installed, it's from the sun. It's basically free. I have solar power on my home, and our electrical bill is usually seven to $15. So it's a great investment. Wow. Now, what do you, I mean, so other young people who are out there maybe watching this, what can you tell them about where they should get started? So if they're, if they're inspired by what you're doing right now, but they're like, I don't know how she did what she did. Like, what can I do? I can't vote like she said. Um, what, what are some steps they can take to get started? What would you suggest? So there's a lot of things that people can do to become involved with environmental issues. It's, especially climate change. So one of the things that you can do no matter what your age is, is you can replace all the light bulbs in your home to LED light bulbs because they're more cost efficient and they lower your carbon footprint. And if you're younger, you can ask your parents to do that. That's an easy fix. Um, when you're older, you can invest in a electrical car or solar panels on the roof of your home. And if you want to become involved with your local government, they will listen to you. I've proven that time and time again by just reaching out to them, writing them letters, going to speak to them in person to the commission. Um, in 2015, when I was 15 years old, I actually went and I lobbied the Miami-Dade County um, Commission and mayor because in their budget, their draft budget, they hadn't allocated any money towards climate change or sea level rise. It was a 1,000 page long, three volume budget. And there was only one sentence about sea level rise and zero money. So I went and I asked them for a million dollars in person. And that very same day, while they didn't agree to my $1 million request, they agreed to allocate $300,000. And they created Miami-Dade County's very first chief resiliency officer. And yeah, it's crazy. And then later the, that year, they increased the budget to $1.2 million, and the budget for this year is $1.7 million for sea level rise. So it proves that anyone can have a voice in their local government, no matter what their age is. I was 15 years old. I am and, dumbfounded. Wow. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, it's crazy. So there's a lot of things that you can do in your community to help solve the climate change crisis. I think you bring up a really good point. When people like me call up their elected officials, they're like, oh, that's Zach. But when kids call, you actually have an advantage that you, you just pointed out, which is kids are cute. And so, right, you want to go speak to a board and they're like, oh, some kids are going to come talk to us. They can't say no to you. Absolutely. It's yeah, it's like you have a special superpower. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, do you think that young people are getting educated about climate change or do you think that they're not knowing about this issue? I think that young people are being educated about climate change. So part of my nonprofit organization, the Sink or Swim Project, is an educational aspect. And through that part, we give lectures to all ages. So elementary school, middle school, high school, colleges, adult groups. And when I talk to elementary schoolers and middle schoolers and high schoolers, what I find is that often they have more questions than the adults and that's because they want to know more they want to learn more and most of the questions are actually about solutions so i use real science in all of my presentations and they understand it very well they understand that carbon dioxide is increasing and that that is not good for our environment and they understand that when they look at these graphs that are all trending in an upward manner and so they want to know how they can solve it and that's where most of their questions come from and so i think that children absolutely understand how big of a threat climate change is and that's why they're so curious in how they can help in their very own community i saw you on your website uh, sink or swim project which is on miamiseerise.com there's a movie there which i urge everyone to see it's a 10-part movie called ahead of the tide um, in episode one you asked an important question you're like my name's delaney i can understand sea level rise and the risk why can't our leaders 
And I want yeah. to ask you that question. I mean, if kids can understand this and ask intelligent questions, why can't our leaders understand what's going on? Or do they understand what's going on and they just don't want to face it? So in most cases, our leaders higher up in our system are usually being paid by um, subsidy with subsidies from utilities and um, special interest groups. So they are protecting the special interest groups and the power utilities, the oil companies, place, um, things like that. And so they deliberately deny that climate change is existing. For example, our governor, Rick Scott, denies basically he doesn't even talk about climate change he refuses to talk about it right. and he the, those words terms. are banned right yeah right he banned the terms climate change sea level rise global warming within the use within our government and it's absolutely ridiculous our local united states senator marco rubio denies that it's caused by humans at all and he has children that live here in miami he grew up here as well so it's completely immoral and we absolutely deserve leaders that are better our entire planet deserves leaders that are environmentally focused because we need to move forward into the future rather than backwards into a polluting past now, Jesse and I just recently drove down to the Florida Keys. One day we were looking at a map and we we're like, there's a supercharger on the Florida Keys. Let's go. And we drove down there um, and it was beautiful and it's so fragile. I mean, you're driving along causeways that it looks like it's amazing they're still there. So you live down there, right? You're on a key called the No Name Key. Yes, that is true. Tell us about your home. So No Name Key is a 1,000 acre island off of Big Pine Key and there's only 43 homes on it. So it's very small and it's in the middle of two wildlife refugees, the great blue heron refugee and the key deer. And so there's way more animals than humans. The little key deer run around everywhere and the homes are all solar powered. So they all run on solar and they all have cisterns. So it's very environmentally friendly, completely off the grid. And that's really where my passion for the environment came from. Because growing up in a solar powered home, I had to learn how to live with that. And it's very easy. As I said, our electrical bill is seven to $15. So it's amazing down there. It's beautiful and I absolutely love it. Now you're on the front line. I mean, from what I hear, Miami and the South Florida region would be the first hit, will be the first hit as sea level rise continues. And right. so this is, I mean, I think a new information to a lot of Americans, right? They kind of think, oh, Florida will always be there, but it won't. No. And so things like the Everglades, Miami Beach, all these big, you know, the Keys, places that Americans know about are disappearing as the sea level rises. Can you talk about like, how long that's going to take? Because I think most Americans think, oh, well, this won't happen for thousands of years, so I shouldn't care. So actually, it's already happening. In Miami Beach, they have already been seeing the effects, and they've been spending $500 million to install pumping systems, to raise roads and sidewalks, because people physically could not go to work. They could not get into their business. They were losing business because customers couldn't go into their business. And... So we're already seeing the effects. And like you said, the Keys is extremely fragile. There have been multiple times where all of the marinas have been flooded, so cars can't get in and out. Um, my island has been flooded a couple times. So it's very real, it's happening now. And in the future, seas are definitely going to rise two to three feet because of the damage that we've already done in the past because of all of the carbon dioxide that we have polluted into our atmosphere and oceans. So now it's really up to my generation to stop it from rising six to 10 feet or more as it is predicted within our lifetimes. So it's a very real threat that we're currently facing. Okay, when are you gonna run for president? That's, we need to know this. <laughs> I get asked that so much. You, well, it's for a good reason, Delaney, because I'm gonna be out there holding your sign. What, are, are, you, you. are you seriously considering running for office? Like, I know that's a few years away, but like uh, mayor, maybe, or a congresswoman, uh, something. It's definitely possible. I've thought about politics. Um, right now, I'm just about to start college, so my focus is obviously getting my education. All right, we'll um, and you whether go. or not I take the law track is undecided yet. I've definitely been looking into it, so it's possible that I do have a future in politics, but I'm not sure yet. Yay. Okay, well, we're going to push for that because that would be fantastic. <laughs> um, now, you're an author. You have written books on the subject. Where can we get a hold of these books, and what book? what are they? 
So I, in between elementary and middle school, I wrote three children's books on ecology topics based on No Name Key. And all of those books are self-published on blurb.com. You can just type in my name, Delaney Reynolds, and they will pop up. Um, I've also written a comic book for children to explain what climate change is using science, how it's going to affect us in the future, and what we can do to help solve it. Um, and that you can find on my website, miamiseerise.com. And currently, I'm in, the progr I'm in the process of finishing my fourth book, which is also on climate change. This one is geared more towards young adults. And so it's also about, like I said, it's about climate change. Um, but it's specifically focusing on the effects, explaining the science in a way that anyone can understand it, telling stories of real people who are being impacted. So I've visited Miami Beach and I talked to business owners, I've spoken to homeowners, um, I've spoken to politicians. Mayor Stoddard was one of the people that I interviewed because his home is completely solar powered as well. And he has a very interesting perspective because not only is he a mayor, but he's also a science professor at Florida International University. So he has that double perspective kind of. Um, and then it also talks about solutions. So I am working on, I've finished drafting it. Right now I'm going through through it again and I hope to have that published within the next six months. That's awesome. So big, can Thank people you. go to MiamiCRise.com and find these things? Yes, they can. Awesome. So I urge everyone to go there because it's full of awesome movies and blogs. You have a blog there so we can follow you yes. on your blog. That's fantastic. Yes. Um, what does it feel like to go to schools and to, because you've gone to, dozens of schools right what does it feel like to talk to the kids directly it's it's amazing and i think that it has a really big impact on the children too because they see someone of their age of their generation speaking to them and i think that they can connect with me on a level that is unlike any other because of the small age gap they're they're so close to my age that it's much easier for me to talk to them and to get through to them than it would be an older person. Um, and so it actually inspires me how much these children and college students care about our environment and how involved they want to become. They're so driven to learn about the solutions. And so that's part of the reason why I've been continuing my work with the Sink or Swim project, because of the reaction that I receive from the people that I present to, because they are so engaged with my presentations and the solution that they find out about. Um, so it's it's absolutely amazing and I love doing it. So that's that's what I would say. Your TED talk um, that I saw is so inspiring. I urge everyone to go see it. We're going to put the link down below here um, because in just, I think you had just like five minutes or seven minutes or something to to get your point out, and you just covered so many things and so inspirationally. Um, that must have been, I don't know, a little scary, was it? Yes, it was very. Scary. <laughs> so um, I actually rewrote that speech eighteen times. I had about 10 different versions of the PowerPoint and it was absolutely crazy. We had it completely memorized. We only had one chance to practice on the stage. So it was very nerve wracking. It was like now or never. But once I was up there and once I started, it was it was actually very fun. Um, I got to look out into the audience and see that there were probably 5,000 people there watching my TED talk and there were people online thousands of people online and it was an amazing experience and it really gave me the opportunity to share my story and Miami story with a very large audience and that's really what the point of giving the TED talk was to share the plight of South Florida with as many people as possible. And I just got to ask as we wrap up here what was it like meeting Vice President Al Gore and like working <laughs> with him these past few weeks? It was very cool. He's one of my biggest inspirations with all of my work because he is so involved with climate change, obviously. And so it was amazing to get to meet him and talk to him about the work that he's been doing. And the fact that he's so engaged with every single person that he talks to is absolutely amazing. So he's one of my biggest inspirations. He continues to be one of my biggest inspirations. I own all of his books, his movie. Um, I got to see a screening of an inconvenient sequel in advance. It's amazing. I urge everyone to go and see it starting August 4th. It's 
so good. And even if you don't believe in climate change, you need to see this movie. Everyone needs to see it. It's so important. And the work that Mr. Vice President Gore has been doing is extremely important as well. So he was amazing to get to talk to and to meet. So it was one of the greatest opportunities of my lifetime. That's awesome. Last question here. Um, kids seem to get it, like you said, and adults yes. don't. Does that give you hope or does that make you pessimistic about the future? It absolutely gives me hope. I think that climate change is the biggest issue that my generation will ever face. And I think that it's going to be up to us to solve it. It's our problem now. And so I think the fact that so many children are so engaged with this problem and they want to learn more about solutions and how they can help in their very own community is extremely encouraging because it proves to me that we will be able to solve this problem. I absolutely have faith that we will be able to solve this problem as long as we continue to work together and be engaged. So it definitely gives me hope for the future. That's awesome. If I could just say one thing to Vice President Al Gore, I hope in four years he calls you up and he doesn't stop pestering you to run for office because I know you're gonna listen to him, right? <laughs> yes, I couldn't disobey Al Gore. <laughs> you hear that, Al? That's your job. Four years. Set a reminder on your Google Calendar. That's your job. Thank you so much, Delaney, for talking to us today. I know you're super busy. I want you to get back to work saving the planet. And thank you so much for talking to us here at Now You Know. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Delaney. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.